Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to have with us this evening for our first talk of the um, autumn season, uh, Ian Merrill, who's the British Dragonfly Society uh, recorder for Leicestershire and Rutland. And he's going to uh, update us on all the exciting developments in the dragonfly world uh, recently in our county, of which there are a lot, I believe. So, um, Ian, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, great stuff. So, as I said a couple of minutes ago, I've got a lot of slides I'm going to whiz through here, and I'm going to be doing it fairly rapidly. And what I'm thinking, there's, there's probably a lot of different levels of interest and understanding of dragonflies amongst the audience. So what I've tried to do is, is stitch in a little bit of something from every for, for everyone. So this, hopefully on my introductory slide there we go this is the agenda for the next hour and i will you know, i've committed to getting this just just tipping under the hour mark but uh, as you can see there's probably a little bit to, to tittle tickle all taste there so i'm the um bds recorder for, for bc55 as alan just said so hence i'm going to do my big pitch my big salon dragonfly recording up front um and then i'll spread it out much more broadly so i thought you probably want to know a little bit about dragonfly life cycles if you don't know a lot about dragonflies and then i'll lead us through habitats and, and where to look for them in bc55 and i'm i'm leaving what i think is the best bit till the end but as i say the it's, there's a little bit of uh, diversity there and I'm going to whiz through them rapidly and then we've got a big chunk of Q&A at the end and then we can move back and focus into what's, what's your uh, individual interest. So without further ado, I will move on. So this is my uh, recording um, session then. So what I've done out to, done to start with is, is set out the history of recording in BC 55 and you'll instantly say well there's a lot of records before 1994 which I'm very much aware of so we've got records going back to, to Victorian times but there was this wonderful baseline work done by um, Steve Grover and Helen Eichen in 1994 and this is the first book that I grasped when I was starting to get into dragonflies you know sort of 30 odd years ago and this provided us the first time we'd actually got atlas maps which which uh, uh, give me the greatest pleasure or give me a lot of pleasure in, in recording terms and this gives a great baseline so we can see what what was uh, distributions of different species look back look like back then so this is it's fascinating to thumb through that so you roll on 20 years to 2014 and then there was a huge push led by the British Dragonfly Society and, and I was in post as the BC55 recorder by that stage to record dragonflies right through the length and the breadth of the UK and this was a fantastic piece of work but this really focused interest across the whole of the country so from a Leicestershire perspective you can say I put the little circle around Leicestershire and if you go back to 2008 there wasn't a hell of a lot no about dragonflies in last year in Rutland um, in a so to context this so this is the vice county diversity threshold it, it sounds complicated but it's the the BDS's clever measure of how they um, measure how well a county was recorded so if you imagine you live in the southeast of the UK you've got a lot of species to go there's a lot more dragonflies that are resident down there you live in the north of Scotland then there's there's a lot fewer we're in the middle in um, in BC 55 and the threshold was set in which we were benchmarked against as to how well we recorded on a 10 kilometer to bit grid square base through the county but if you have a look at the outcomes in the year that just before the, the atlas was produced we've actually got every 10 kilometer grid square covered to the required threshold in the county so that means we've had a as good a try um, and we've ticked all the bds boxes as well as anywhere in the entire country so leicestershire is as well recorded as anywhere else in the country i'm uh, very proud of that fact um, so we've done all this work for the 2014 and it, it would have been uh, uh, really uh, foolish not to have put it some good use. So as you can see in 2015, I've highlighted that, that's when I produced the first um, distribution atlas. Um, it's a thorough update, it's, it's a checklist of the VC55 species in 2015. So um, there's a, a massive, massive data that was used with that to produce all these distribution maps. And then that sat still and then 
oh well may of may of 2020 so the first spring of lockdown i thought this needs a thorough refresh i've got some time on my hand so this has been produced so if you want to see a, a copy of the uh the, this particular document the checklist it's available on nature spot um you can find your way in there there's a link there and it's also on the uh, the dragonfly group web page which i'll say a little bit more about later so 2020 we were brought up to date and i my hope um is that in this coming winter i'm going to do a, a 2022 i'll work through the winter and we'll publish a new one in 2022 because in the last two years a lot's happened so they're, they're the influences in terms of recording. I've just um, drawn out the influences in terms of literature on dragonfly recordings, and then I'll bring the two together and show you against the actual recording data. But things have progressed. So when I started my dragonfly interest, there was this uh, wonderful Bob Merritt booklet that was out there. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a small paperback book, but that was the only source of reference that was around. But I think if you could look at the, the images, there's an extract there. They're very much entomological images and these were drawn clearly with a with a hand lens and someone's looking at the fine vaniculations in the wing of a dragonfly and they look a little bit flat and lifeless you know as if there was a pin through them and I, I just wanted to illustrate how things had progressed from the the era when people were out with their with their hands net and um and uh, and a lens to study the detail of insects in the hand. Now, what the vast majority of people are doing, and it's such an enjoyable way to do it, is with your close focusing binoculars. So we move through, and there's some lovely little vignettes that Steve Grover produced in the 1994 um, booklet. But you, when you start looking at the work of, uh, of Richard Lewington, who's, who's a real hero, hero of mine, um, in terms of entomological illustration that these are absolutely outstanding and this has really stimulated interest and um, anyone who wants a dragonfly book get the get the 2014 version of um, Brooks Cameron Lewington and I think if anyone flicks through the pages of, of these guys these these insects really come alive and it stimulates people they think these, there's some fantastic dragonflies in the county I need to to get out there and look for them so if you overlay these two influences, and it's, it's real straightforward, it looks a bit complicated, but all it is, it's a bar chart with the number of dragonfly records that I've received or I've got in the database over the years. And I've drawn out what I think are the influences. It, they might not be the actual real ones, but I think there's a very good argument that all of these cause various blips in the recording cycle. So starting off, we're bumbling along through the 1970s, not a lot of records, and you see this little blip in 76. And I'm sure a lot of you remember that was the hot summer, wasn't it, when we had the uh, the ladybirds were everywhere. There's a lot of lot of very fair weather, and there'll be a lot of people out recording dragonflies. So an interesting blip there. Not a lot else happens. And then 1993, boom, Bob Merritt produces his book, and instantly people can identify. There's a single source of information, and they can identify what's flying in their part of the world. So that causes a ripple. And I think um, Helen and Steve's book, that is a real great example. If, if you produce a book that just covers the, the species group in your county it really does draw an interest and I think this was published in 94 and then 94 and 95 that's the first time we got over a thousand records so that's really interesting um Mr Lewington's book doesn't have as big an influence as you as you, as you may think but I'm sure this adds to the interest in this this the next big cliff and this is another way of you know getting interested groups together, like-minded people. So I set up the, the website, the last year in Muslim Dragonfly Group, and all that served to do was, was focus people on recording and um, flag up what was available to see and, and also where the gaps were in the atlases. And, and that stimulated a lot of interest. Things drop away again. And then this is the big push for the 2014 atlas. So we've now got the county um, divided up on a 10 kilometre grid square base. So we're trying to fill those gaps we start off and then bad weather so bad weather influences us and i know for a fact 11 was an awful year and it really had an impact but then we managed to to, to make the push and produce this wonderful work 
Things then bumble along a little bit of highs and lows. But look at 2020, we're close to 3,000 records, and it's the most records ever in uh, in a year for VC55. And clearly, a couple of things were at work there. Um, we were we were in um, we got a pandemic, and we were we were locked down, and we couldn't go very far. So a lot more people with more time on the hands, they're out recording, and that also stimulated me. I, it prompted me to produce this uh, Leicestershire and Rutland Dragonfly Group. Facebook page. Now, I'm not a social media advocate at all. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Facebook, but in the right circumstances, it can really stimulate some interest. And I would recommend anybody with a particular interest group, recording group, think about Facebook because it, it really has worked for the Dragonfly group. So that's looking at the timeline. And so now you're all fired up and you're thinking, great, this is how recording works. What can I do? How can I contribute? And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of all these, of these um, forums already, but this is how you can send your records in. Um, and I'll explain how they circulated. So our record is the, the nation's natural history recording scheme, and it's got a great intuitive website. So you just look up your site with an OS background and start populating it with your records. I'm sure everyone on the call must be aware of Nature Spot. We're so lucky to have this uh, resource within the county, and it's got a very similar recording methodology. Find your site on the background. That's my garden pond in Whittick and start entering your records. Or this is my preferred format because I do produce quite a lot of records and I'll put them into a spreadsheet and then I'll do a bulk upload into MapMate at the end of the year. And anyone who finds this easier, drop me a line. I will send you a, a, um, a spreadsheet template with some instructions on how to fill it in. Um, so any, any method, I don't mind how you send your records in and they're, up, they're all shared. Um, and this is what, what I get particularly excited about. So we, we put the atlases together with the recording methodology. Um, and what is brilliant, if you in your part of the county, if you um, think, where are, the, where are the gaps? I can see the dots. So this is an illustration last spring. I'm thinking, well, there really should be large red-eyed damsel flying that 10 kilometer grid square in the Far East. So this is a wonderful resource. It's called um, Grab a Grid. Um, and you get a, um, it, it, it's um, free access on the internet. And as you can see, you get your satellite image next to your OS background, and then you find a site. And if you're lucky, you can go out there and the site is actually as good as it looks. So um, I was able to add large red eyed damsel fly quite readily last spring. This is how it all fits together then. So I'm encouraging you to, uh, to send your records in in whatever way you can. But just to reassure you that everything is spread, not only it's shared, not only through the county, but actually nationally. So if you choose to send your records through, through myself as the recorder or to Nature Spot or iRecord, then I've got a verification role in there, but all that is shared. Um, you could also send direct, say, the Lugbra Natural, Russell Natural History Society, Everything is shared with the Leicestershire and Rutland Environmental Recording Centre. And then it's also shared, the loop goes back and forth through the National Biodiversity Network gateway um, via the BDS, if I'm sending them in. So you can see that everything ideally should all work perfectly. I should get a flow of data back from the uh, recording centre at the start of the year and can update maps accordingly. But it's really important because I can look at a dot on a map, but think about the, the national picture and how these records feed into the, the picture of um, how, how species can um, de decline and increase. And it gives us a feel for the environment. And the dragonflies are right at the top of the food chain. So by recording them, we've got a, a real great input into um, a feel for how the, how the environment is faring at a UK level. So that's my recording cell. So you, you can relax now. I'm not going to uh, hit you anymore on, on the recording front. And this is where we'll get much more, more, more broadly spread. And um, hopefully something of, uh, you, you'll, you'll find something that you didn't know before in this section. I'm going to go through dragonfly life cycle. So I've picked the, uh, the reproduction phase uh, of the life cycle. And then I'll take us right around back to this point again in time. So on the left, you've got a white-legged damselfly, that's a male white-legged damselfly, and he, he's sitting there um, next, to the, next to his chosen water body, and he's um, waiting to, for the arrival of a female. 
Now, before he's taken up this position, or quite likely before he has, what he will have done, so in order for the fertilisation to take place, he will have um, transferred a sack of sperm from his segment number eight. So all dragonflies and dandelions have got 10 segments, by the way. You can count them top to bottom. The first one's a tiny one, but, but the rest are all fairly obvious. So he's transferred a sack of sperm into his segment um, number two. Um, and then what he will do, if a female moves by, he'll, uh, he'll grasp the female now, effectively by, this, by the scruff of the neck, but a bit more technically, the pronotum is the section that joins the head to the, uh, to the thorax. And it's uniquely shaped in each species of damselfly so that the female's pronotum is shaped so it will only fit on these claspers, these uh, claspers on the end of the... Uh, the abdomen on that prevents mechanically, effectively, different species actually cross um, cross fertilizing. So the male will take a, take a female. This is what's called um, in dragonfly terms the tandem position, and then he'll he'll offer her up into the wheel position, which is unique to dragonflies. Dra dragonfly reproduction, and the, he'll offer up the female's um, second section. Um, no, his eighth, the female's eighth section to his second, and that's where the actual fertilisation of the eggs will take place. So if the female's receptive, she'll hopefully drop into place. And this is this is actually dragon, damselflies and dragonflies in this wheel position. So this is a small red-eyed damselfly. And so the female there, um, section eight onto the male section uh, section two, and that's where the fertilisation is actually taking place of her eggs. But the male's a bit clever as well, because what he can also do within this in this secondary genitalia, if he finds any sperm on the in, um, that the female has taken in from a previous male, he can actually craftily remove that, um, and actually then he's uh, at the top of the reproductive uh, scale. Moving on, everything does it the same. So all species will engage in this wheel position. And this is a, uh, a migrant hawker dragonfly, which is doing exactly the same thing. Just one subtle difference with the dragonflies in that the, uh, the anal claspers on the end of the male's abdomen are actually, rather than the pronotum, as you can see, it's actually grasping the rear of the female's head. And similarly, this is shaped just to fit the female of the same species. So there we go, fertilization has taken place. The next stage is, is the egg laying, the ovipositing. So all of the damselflies and the dragonflies, the large dragonflies, will actually um, oviposit, lay their eggs through this, this ovipositor, which is a, um, a sickle-shaped um, needle, effectively, that injects the eggs one at a time into the chosen substrate, which in most cases is plant tissue. So this is emerald damselfly, which will it lay its eggs into plant tissue. And the damselflies invariably still maintain this tandem position where they're up positing and this is a brown hawker doing just the same thing um, so this is laying single eggs into its preferred substrate so this is rotting material quite often a, a rotten log so this is laying its eggs into rotten wood at the side of the pool but dragonflies will generally oviposit singly but the male will still sometimes hang around to defend the female then moving on, um, as I say in different substrates and I'll talk a lot more about willow emerald um, further down the line, but this is the new species in the county, and this is unique in the whole of the UK, it's the only species that oviposits into, into a, a wood, so it, generally a willow stem overhanging the water, and this is a female just looking ovip to oviposit into this willow stem. Another strategy then, are the libelli lids, they're the, uh, this is common or uh, common darter, so the darters, the chasers and the skimmers, the libelli lid dragonflies have got a slightly different strategy, so they've, re they've um, fertilised, they've returned to the tandem position and many will fly around in tandem, but rather than laying single eggs, they will actually uh, single legs in, into plant tissue. They'll lay often a, a little cluster of eggs directly into the water surface. So there, the female is dipping the tip of her abdomen into the water and just randomly scattering eggs, which you've got um, a substance around there. Imagine a um, tiny version of frog spawn, which will expand and protect the eggs to some degree, but clearly they are more vulnerable to predators. So eggs are laid, and then this is the end of the current season. So 
different strategies for different species. So the, the, the species that lay their eggs at the end of the season, the eggs tend to go into diet balls. So, so that is the uh, probably things like emerald damsel fly, common dart, migrant hawker. So the eggs lay the winter and then hatch out in the spring and have a very rapid turnaround. Whereas species that will have laid their eggs earlier in the year, there'll already be larva and they will actually lie dormantly through the winter. Not very much will happen in the winter. And then most species have got a life cycle of one to two years. Some of the larger ones might take up to four years to mature. So, but then um, after one to four years, the following spring, as the days start to lengthen and the uh, the water temperature grows warmer, then they're actually it's time to emerge. So this is broad-bodied chaser emerging from the pond in, on a on the uh, wonderful spring day, and you can see how the uh, the larva has climbed up and the the, the larval case has split and the adult has emerged. So. This all your eggs in one basket. So this is a reminder for me to, to, to mention the different emergent strategies. So the broad body chaser is one that does put largely all its eggs in one basket. And this will have a synchronized emergent. So a lot of um, most of the population could emerge within a matter of days. So by doing this, you've got lots and lots of adults on the wing at once. So they're more likely to find a mate of the, uh, the appropriate species and reproduce. But the big risk is that the weather could be really poor. If there's uh, a lot of rain at the time, it, it could really they have a devastating effect on the whole population for a season. And the opposite thing to do, the, what, what um, species like large red damselfly will have an emergence period over a much more protected time. So there's less insects on the wing at once but you avoid the downfalls of the first weather. So the adults emerge um, and these are called tenerals by the way that's another dragonfly term so a tenerel insect so this is a migrant hawker but it's very much devoid of colours of the adult at this stage um, and what will happen over time it starts the insect starts to harden so it's the same insect is on the right it's a, it's a southern hawker again it will have probably emerged the large species emerge overnight because they're very vulnerable to predators and then come the next morning these insects are, are, are very obvious this was at the side of my garden pond but they start to harden up and they start to darken but they will fly directly away from a pond this is just to illustrate how things change over time then so this is a tenoral um, a uh, migrant hawker um, recently emerged, very washed out colours, very subdued. This will move away from the water and they're often found in woodland clearings and depending on the species, several days to several weeks. And then this is the same same species. So this is an adult migrant hawker and it's worn, returned to the water to breed. And you can see how it's uh, taken up the adult covers, quite an amazing transformation. And then it will find a mate and the whole thing happens again. So this is emperor dragonfly again in the wheel position and the reproductive cycle starts all over again. So that's taking you right through reproduction. Next section, we'll have a little rattle through habitats and where to look for dragonflies. And I'm going to go small to large in the county and just trot us through the different water bodies, the different habitat types and what might be found there. First of all, I want to do my big sell on creating a pond in your garden. So um, we'll start on a garden pool and what species can be attracted there. But um, I'm sure anyone who, um, with, with an awareness of, of um, yeah, lo local wildlife and, and statistics, know, know what a, what a tor torrid time and how habitats are diminishing um, at a, such a dramatic rate. And I, I just really want to encourage anyone with any space in the garden to, to, to shoehorn a, a pool in of some size, the larger the better, but even the tiniest pools have tremendous value. I think if you think about surrounding gardens, I know around me, if I look around, there's a, there's a sea of um, decking and gravel and plastic grass, heaven forbid. And yeah, this is our chance to, to actually give something, uh, give wildlife a little bit of something to hold on to, not just dragonflies. And it's tremendously easy. So pick your spot, you want somewhere nice and sunny, sheltered. Um, I cut down quite a large tree. This is 10 years ago when I did this, but um, a large cherry tree had to go because shade isn't any good for dragonflies. Um, this is the civil engineer in me coming out. So this is my lovely wife, Victoria, making sure that the, the pond is level because it would be quite embarrassing if you filled it with water and it disappeared through one end of your pond. Um, then you dig a hole um, a couple of feet deep, ideally, but 
the, the important bit is lots and lots of shallows because they're the important areas. That's where you plant your marginal plants and the areas where the dragonflies will thrive. Um, put some carpet down because you're going to spend a lot of money on a beautiful rubber liner and you don't want it to, to pierce the liner or newspaper works equally as well. Then put your liner in and these cost several hundred pounds, but it's worth the investment and mine's 10 plus years old now. Actually, I've seen the dates. It's about 10 years old now and it's still going very strong. Fill it with water, allow the chlorine to dissipate, trimming and landscaping. And I've put beg and borrow your plants because most people know someone, a friend or a neighbour who's got some uh, some pond plants they can, they can uh, scrounge because it's very expensive in a nursery. And I've added beware invasive species. I've got a terrible problem with New Zealand pygmy weed at the moment, which I'm trying to eradicate. And even from a small pond, it's very difficult. And it is the, the, real, uh, the real plague to a lot of uh, local wetland areas. It's causing a lot of trouble. And don't put anything in that's uh, going to grow too rigorously, like um, reed mace, for example. Be a bit selective. And then this is the easy bit. So you set up your deck chair and, and wait to see what arrives. And it's not just dragonflies, it's, it's, it's all manner of wildlife will benefit hugely from the introduction of a garden pond. But just to show how dragonflies will come to you. So this is April. So this is the end of April. Um, and this is these are all photos taken in that first year. So um, exactly two months later, I get the first arrival at the, 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 at the pond. And it, this illustrates what fantastic opportunist dragonflies are. They will come and find any available water body. They will seek it out. So this is blue-tailed damselfly came along. A few days later, large red damselfly to be expected at Garden Pond. And this is broad-bodied chasers. So a pair of these appeared. And, and these are real classic colonists of new water bodies. Um, common blue damselfly. Um, common data and by the end of that first season I'd already attracted nine species and six of them were ovipositing um, so fantastic start and to date I've recorded 12 species seven are breeding and anyone who wants a little bit more background on digging a pond for dragonflies the BDS website has got this wonderful little booklet which you can download in PDF format so just then expanding broader and broader and picking on different habitats. I'm just going to introduce other species to you that you might find in that area. So as soon as you increase your surface area of water, you almost certainly start to see the, the emperor dragonfly, which is very widespread, spectacular dragonfly. If you've got good quality water, so start thinking of areas around, around close to where you live, where you might go recording that, that have got some of this habitat. So lots of emergent vegetation and good water quality, then you might start to see things like four-spotted chaser, emerald damselfly, ruddy darter are all good indicators of good habitat with lots of emergent vegetation. Step up a level to a lakes and gravel pits. And if you've got lots of bare, veg um, bare areas around um, a, a lake or a gravel pit, bare earth, then the black-tailed skimmer is uh, almost certainly going to be there. That likes perching on, um, on bare ground. Um, migrant hawkers like the larger water bodies, that's, uh, that's almost certain to be found there, still in evidence at the moment. And then the two species we've got now of um, red-eyed damselfly, the large here and the small red-eyed damselfly on the right, then they cross the boundaries as well. So uh, they're all still water species of all types. Canals are essentially still water. There's a little bit of a flow in the canals, in there, but they're essentially linear still water bodies. But they attract slightly different species in Leicestershire. So I'll, I'm going to group the canals we've got together. So this is a picture of the Ashby Canal, but um, it would look very similar if it was a photograph of the Grand Union Canal. And these are well trafficked by boats, and it stirs all the mud up into this lovely brown pea soup, which does limit the diversity somewhat, but you'll still get species like um, banded demoiselle there, and both are good sites for white-legged damselfly as well. But the jewel in the crown, and, and probably one of the finest sites for Odenata in the county, is the Grantham Canal. I've had a couple of visits this year after, after an absence of some time, and it is a, a wonderful site. And there's no boats on there, so there's no boat traffic moves up and down the canal. There are sites that have become very vegetated and actually dried out, but some stretches, and um, this is close to Redmire, there's a lot of water soldier in there, um, and it is... Um, 
absolutely prolific with dragonflies and it's the best place to see variable damsel fly in the, in the county without a doubt and it's it's arguably the best place the easiest place to see hairy dragonfly as well so pay a visit to the grantham canal and moving water so the tiniest streams are going to hold a, a number of species um, diversity can be fairly low so this is azure damselfly you'll almost see it fine and azure damselfly in the, sm in the smallest streams um, large red will occur you, you'll almost certainly find a banded demoiselle on uh, streams of this nature and one to start to be aware of that's edging into the county now is beautiful demoiselle but more on that one later then we get to the wider rivers, so the flow starts to slow, they're broader. We'll get a slightly different set of species, again, some overlap. But the one that really comes into play with the larger rivers is, is scarce chaser. And this is the, the northern end of the saw, and it's also on the uh, the lower reaches of, of the Welland. Um, White leg damselfly also on the Welland, and then uh, when we go on to the Reek, that's got a fantastic population of white leg -like damselfly, and hairy dragonflies are, are becoming quite prolific on the Welland, and also very widespread on the Upper Saw. So I think that's covered all the habitats, and now I'll, I'll, I'll slow things down a little, go, go into more detail into uh, the species. I will uh, start talking about some identification criteria. Um, but what I wanted to do to start with, now you're probably pleased to know I'm not going to go through these one at a time. I've, I've lumped these together a little bit more subtly. In fact, we've got 30 species in Leicestershire on, on our county list of dragonflies. And of these, six of them are actually vagrants. So if you think you've only got 24 species to learn, I just wanted to try and get across. If you're new to dragonflies, it really is quite manageable. You know, you compare this with the birds we've got in the county in excess of 300, we've got a couple of thousand moths. So to get your head around 24 species, it's, it's pretty easy. It's a, it's a wonderful little group to actually explore and, and get an understanding of very rapidly. So what I'm doing, I'm, I'm grouping some of these together. So I've called this, this, this group, the confusing little blue ones. And people will often say, oh, I'm just done that to look, look, to look at dragonflies. Lots of blue ones flying around, you know, it's very confusing, but hopefully I'll demonstrate that they're actually not. These are all images of males, by the way. And what I'll always say to people who are starting their dragonfly journey is forget the females initially, you'll always see males at a, at a good sight. So uh, put the females to the back of your mind for now. Um, easiest first and most widespread blue-tailed damselfly. So if you see a damselfly that's got a black abdomen with a nice neat blue band close to the tip, that's going to be a blue-tailed damselfly. But another key, and I'll introduce another couple of terms to you here that you may not be familiar with, but terostigma are the dark markings close to the end of each of the wing tips. Um, and in blue-tailed, it's important to look at the terostigma because you see it's bicolored, it's light and dark, and that is unique in the damselfly. So there you go, blue-tailed sorted, that's a nice easy one. Another easy one, and it's one of my favorite species, is, is the white-legged damselfly. So another term is antihumeral stripes. They're effective with the shoulder stripes. So it goes from, from the pronotum, from the neck to, to the basis of the wing. So this is an important area in identification. And you'll see that on white leg damselfly, it's got two blue stripes. And it's the only species with two blue stripes compared with the rest. So double antihumeral stripes, shoulder stripes, but also look at this terror stigma, the dark markings towards the tip of the wings, and this, this wonderful tan colour on a white leg damselfly, and nothing else has got that. So there we are, two very easy ones. This group of four gets people scratching the head a little bit more, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Again, with the close focus in binoculars, you can work your way through this. So antihumeral stripes again, common blue has got a very broad blue antihumeral stripe and a thin black stripe. And the other species have got rather a narrow stripe. And also the second segment marking starts to come into play. So, Looking from above, imagine this is half of the symmetrical shape. It's got a club shape on the second segment. So club shape, broad antihumeral stripe, blue, common blue damselfly, that's very easy. Then we're down to the last two, variable and azure. Now, these, these are in a, a family called Coenagrian, which are peculiar to having this little black spur. So both species have got the black spur on the side of the thorax. But then look at the antihumeral stripe. So a solid blue line on azure damselfly. And if we go on to variable, it's actually got a little exclamation mark. 
Now, varied bull is much, is much scarcer species, but I just wanted you to be aware that they are out there. Uh, but you see a dot and a dash, so that's really easy. They are variable and the, that, the break is less obvious there. But the other feature is what to look for on the, uh, on the second segment. So on a variable, um, again, imagine this symmet symmetrically drawn and that's effectively a wine glass. It's a, it's a wine glass joined to the, the base of the second segment. On Azure, it's got a little Honda badge, and that's actually not joined to the base of the second segment. So there we go. That's the confusing little blue ones, which actually I think you'll admit they're not that confusing anymore. Another species group, and these are flying at the moment, the darter. So the common and ruddy darter, people often um, ask about these. And the first thing I'd draw your attention to, again, this is, these are males, but just look at the distribution maps and you'll see that the common data is actually the common one. Um, if you see um, a red data perched on your patio in the sun, it's almost certainly going to be a common data. And I'd go for that one and then try to eliminate ruddy, which is got much, uh, much more um, tighter preferences for, <coughs> for good habitat. So, you don't generally get this in your guard, but features to look for. The real key one is the yellow stripe down the legs. And people say, surely you're not looking at the colour on the legs of a damselfly. It is remarkably easy with your close focusing binoculars and compare that with the real jet back legs on a ruddy data. Common data has got a very parallel sided abdomen. Ruddy data has got this, this nice tapered waist effect. That, that is really quite obvious. It's a little bit smaller as well. But it is very, I can also say it's post office red or post box red, whereas common dart is more brick red. It's got an orangey tint to it. Um, and also, same applies to the eyes of the ruddy data. And this, the fronds, this is the facial shield. You can see that's very red. It's much paler on common dart. So that's that pair, hopefully um, set in your minds. And then, the chunky blue ones, which per perch politely, they actually genuinely do, given a little bit of time, will perch up, whereas some species seem to be on the move all the while. So these chunky blue ones, habitat's a bit of a key here. So if you see a chunky blue one perching around the edge of your garden pond, it's almost certainly going to be a broad-bodied chaser. And then looking a little bit more detail, and you can see that the hind wings has got this very large black triangle, and the forewing is a smaller area of black. Wonderful yellow dots around down the side of the broad abdomen. And the antihumeral stripes on this species are very obvious and very blue. If you see a chunky blue one perching politely at the side of the... Uh, the, the River Welland or the Upper Saw, then there's every chance it might be a scarce chaser. So the things to check for there, to distinguish it from broad body chaser, is the, the fact that its black markings on the hind wing are much reduced, it's got hardly any on the fore wing, and it's not got the anti-humeral stripe, and it's got very obvious blue eyes. Black-tailed skimmer. So if you see your blue drag damselfly, blue dragonfly perching on bare ground at the side of a large lake, and this is what we were talking about, is actually Longmore that we were discussing earlier on the call. Um, have a close look, and it's got a, a more elongated abdomen, nice black tip, um, no antihumeral stripes, and quite obvious green eyes. So they're the blue ones. And they will perch, but then this group um, often frustrate people because they do fly quite a lot. Um, they do perch up occasionally, but you're often seeing them in flight. But a lot of the features can be picked up easily with your binoculars when they're flying. So I'll go easiest to hardest. And um, Emperor Dragonfly, a lot of you are probably familiar with this species. It flies around with a slightly kinked abdomen. It's a large, obvious species that will relentlessly patrol the open water. Um, largely blue abdomen and very green thorax, and that's quite an easy one to sort out. Brown hawker, it's the only brown one. It's got some coloured markings on it, but overall it's a brown insect. And these brown tinted wings, so the brown suffusion in the wings is very obvious, and this can be seen well away from water, often in gardens, but nothing else is brown like this. And the remainder, people, people sometimes group these as the mosaic hawkers. Um, these are a lot more similar. The hairy dragonfly is actually slightly separate. To, it's a different family. Now, this flies a lot earlier than the others. So if you see your hawker in largely through June, 
Um, if you've seen a hawker as early as June, then it's going to be a hairy dragonfly because the others haven't emerged yet. Now, this species is a little bit smaller than the others, and habitually it will fly, it'll stay very low, and it will zigzag in and out of reeds around a well vegetated um, water body. If you do see it perched, it's got an, a quite an obvious thin green antihumal stripe. So that's hairy dragonfly. Then we move in later into the season and we've got these three. Now I'm going to eliminate moorland hawker to start with because this is actually a very rare insect. It's called common hawker in the books, but I don't like that name because it's not common anywhere really. So the obvious feature to look for on this is the, this costal edge, the leading edge of both of the wings is yellow. And this is, this is diagnostic. None of the other, the other hawker dragonflies have got this. And it's also got narrow yellow and humal stripes but very few records of this assume it isn't i would really want to see a photograph of this or a very good description to accept a record it's it's right on the edge of its range in leicestershire it just just hangs on but very few records much more likely to be um migrant or southern hawker so southern hawker that's this is a large insect and this stays low down it quite likes dark shady areas it'll it'll be investigating dark corners of your garden and it's got very obvious um there's, there's a lot of beautiful um very almost fluorescent green on it and very obvious anti-humal stripes some people record refer to these as headlights compare that with migrant orca very much reduced yellow antihumeral stripes and it's got this very obvious golf tee a pale golf tee and they do perch quite readily a lot flying at the moment so that's taking you through the large ones and now i've paired up the newcomers because it's good to look at a couple of these together so these are all relatively new to the county some very new to the county so we'll just go through these a pair at a time um, this is a slide I'd already produced on the on the group page. I'm not going to take you blow by blow through all of this, but it's it's already a very readily available slide. But at, at high level, I'll do red first, large red first, because this flies first. So if you're out recording in in June and early July, and you see a damselfly perched on a water lily pad. It's got red eyes and a blue tip to the abdomen. It's almost certainly going to be a large red, large red-eyed damselfly. So the newcomer in you know, it's, it's, it's the last fifteen years, this species appeared in the county. But another, another one to consider now. So if you if you're out recording in in August, this is a high summer species, and you see a small red-eyed damsel damselfly perched on. Um, an algal mat this is the preferred habitat of this species it doesn't need great habitat and um, then it's very likely to be a red-eyed damselfly then we go into the more subtle features but a, a real um, key thing here is the fact that the small red eye does look largely like a blue-tailed damselfly it's quite a quite a dainty insect and if you if you see a large red eye it will be the largest damselfly of the pack and it will be defending its territory quite vigorously and it will appear noticeably larger so hopefully that's put some clarity around these two um, and it's great to be able to talk to you about two emerald species now this is the exciting development in the last few years um, earlier in the season so late July through August, if you were seeing an emerald um, damselfly and they characteristically sit with the wings at 45 degrees, if this is in low down around a well vegetated pond margin, it's going to be common emerald damselfly. If you're seeing them well, late August through September, they're just tailing out now. But if you see an emerald damselfly late in the season, perched in a willow tree, and they do remain motionless for long periods of time, they can be tricky to see. See one late in a willow tree, and it's almost certainly going to be a willow emerald damselfly. So willow emerald, well, we'll do common emerald first, and that's the one you've, you're more likely to encounter at the moment. That's got this lovely blue suffusion on the uh, the underside of the thorax and at either ends of the abdomen, very obvious blue eyes. So all of this is lacking in willow emerald, so it is very obvious, isn't it, in a male? They're, they're, they're nothing like each other. So it's got brown eyes, lacking all of the blue. Um, still a beautiful insect, and it's got this, this creamy colour to the whole of its underside, and this very obvious spur is a real diagnostic feature. So that's the two emeralds, hopefully safely covered and uh, locked in the memory bank. And now the, the demoiselle. So this is another 
you know, um, oh, 10 years ago, you, you'd only have to bother about family demoiselle, but now the uh, beautiful demoiselle is uh, starting to creep in and it's uh, a great problem to actually have. So if you see a demoiselle, it will almost certainly be a banded demoiselle, I would say. So assume it is, and then um, you've got to prove otherwise. So this is a species that likes slower flowing water bodies because it breeds in, in muddy, um, the muddy bottoms of, uh, of, of rivers and canals. So it's, 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 it's quite prolific on canals and then um, streams that look like this is just slowing the, the, uh, the rate of knots right down. The male's very obvious, it's got this clear blue band through its pale wings. The female has got a green suffusion to its wings. So move on to our rare species, and this is one of the few sites where it occurs. I'll, I'll speak more about sites later, but it prefers a stony bottom stream, more rapidly flowing, and it's, it, it's quite happy with a little bit of shade. But very obvious that the male has got a wholly blue wing. The female in this shot looks pretty obvious, and, and they are, when you see a nice obvious female in good light, it's got this wonderful brown suffusion to the wings, but I, I'll admit I struggle with these, and, and some I will, will give up, because in certain lights, uh, certainly a female um, blue, a female banded demoiselle will, will look a little bit brown, so one to be wary of, go for the males if at all possible. So this is what I promised the species update. So this is very hot off the press. This is right bang up to date this year. And these are the three species or the three newest arrivals in the county. So I'll take you through them in turn. I'm going to start off with the beautiful Demoiselle. So 2014 this arrived. So this is where its national distribution lies. And as you can see, it's predominantly a, a Western and Southern species, and it is characteristic to, of, uh, of heathland and moorland. So that this is a site where, where it occurs out to the West. And as you can see, this is a, a stony bottom, fast flowing stream, and, and it's through a habitat of a very sandy substrate and um, a lot of peat. So you can imagine there's not a lot of that around in Leicestershire, or certainly in the Southern reaches of the county. It's just starting to edge in from um, it's, it's moved in through the uh, the, the, the water ways of, um, of the down well Warwick, Warwickshire and Northampton but pr primarily uh, Northamptonshire it's just edged into the county so it's only skirting around the southern boundary so this is where the distribution sits at the moment so if we've not got any optimal habitat for it, this, this is the uh, section of the River Swift where it occurs. It's not a great site for it at all. So historically, it's been very difficult to see in very low numbers. So it, it's dotted around suboptimal sites along the River Welland, then along the River Avon, along the River, the River Swift. And I know Mr Baggett's on the call this evening and he made a wonderful discovery this, this very year. And it's not until um, 2021 that we're actually be able to tell you where to go and, and have a, well, you, you will see if you go at the right time of year, there's, there's quite a healthy population on this, this um, tributary of, I think it's a tributary of the Swift, um, just south of the village of Ullersthorpe. But you can see... Even there, the habitat is not great. You compare it with the moorland site that this site that this species historically liked. So, um, what's going to happen? Well, this is where it is at the moment in very clayey, suboptimal areas. But again, a great opportunist, and this is a record just to the west of um, Leicester for a couple of years back. But this is my prediction that when it actually reaches the Charmwood Forest, and these are just the photos of some of the rivers near to me. So this is the Grace Dew Brook and this is the Black Brook. But look at that. This is, to me, it appears to be classic um, beautiful demoiselle habitat, fast flowing stony bottom streams. Now that they're flowing over the granite of, of Charmwood with, with um, some shade in there. And I, I'm fingers crossed. I think this species will slowly edge up. Be aware of it on your travel. It's going to move up from uh, these niches in the south of the county. But I really like to think that if it discovers Charwood, it really should take off. So next species, scarce chaser. So at the moment, this is only found on the on the very northern reaches of the uh, of the river saw. So this is getting close to the confluence with the uh, trend with Ratcliffe Power Station in the background. But a real good population up there. If you get there at the right time of year, you should see this species quite readily. And then this is the Welland, it's other preferred habitat in the south of the county, right on the North Ants border. But 
quite a quite a weird distribution that it's down in the very south and the very north. Now, I've spent a lot of time, along with a, a gentleman called Mark Piper, plotting out the last couple of years exactly where this occurs on the Welland, and it's limited to the areas where the, where the Welland is starting to get, get um, wide and slow-flowing, and it, it's avoided its absence from the fast-flowing narrow areas. So from, well, from Wakeley down to the county boundary, there's a strong population. So this is close to Collin Western Bridge. So if you need to, if you're out that way in the spring, Collin Western Bridge is great to stand on. It's a little bit dangerous, but you, there's every chance you'll see a, a scarce chase looking either side of the bridge and another little population just downstream of, uh, of the Caldicott area on the Welland. But this is the weird distribution we've got at the moment. So it's obvious why it's moved in from Northamptonshire and it's, it's, it's being found more and more along the Welland. And then we've got this, this crazy little dot at the top of the River Soar. And I can only imagine that a, an opportunist female pair managed to get up to there and set the population off. But we've got loads of gaps in between. Mm, sorry about that. I've got loads of gaps in between that look suitable and you know, I'm just encouraging people to be aware when they're out recording. It's not been found anywhere else on the River Soar, but where is it on the, the lower reaches of the Soar, um, in, in the Loughborough area and even upstream of Leicester? And there's some other great habitats, so I think it could easily move in onto the anchor. So as you can see, this is the, uh, the national distribution on the bottom right, and it's along waterways, so it's occurring to the west of Leicester and, and very much to the south along the Neen, but there are gaps and certainly the areas of the reek look ideal for it. So I'm hoping that this species expands as well. And, and please be aware on your travels when you when you're next to some broad, slow flowing water, then uh, be aware of the uh, of the scarce chaser. Willow Emerald. So this is the massive success story of, of the last couple of years. When I say success story, I mean, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking it's because of global warming, which is not a success story at all. But we, we've got another dragonfly to look for. So reaches the UK in 2007. We only got it in BC 55 in 2019, but this has really taken off. And this year has been absolutely monumental. So this is the some shots from close to where I live of preferred habitat. And you can see lots and lots of overhanging willow. It will oviposit into um, elder. And there's, there's a photograph this year of one ovipositing into ash, which I think is quite unusual, but lots and lots of overhanging willow so they are typical sites to look if you've got any sites like that close close to where you live please go out and explore and this is just illustrates what a, what a bang it's had this year so nationally top right you can see this is the bds um, map that i've uh, obtained and the blue dot show it's, it's pushing its way west right across the land but just in bc 55 so the dots on the map are um, the previous two years, and then all the little stars are the ones that we've been adding this year. So various people on the call have added their dots, and it's expanded massively. It's, it's moved west and north. There's still some question marks for me. There's not a lot of habitat in the south of Leicestershire. I feel it ought to be on the Ashby Canal. I checked again today, and I've not found any there. And I feel it should be in the Trent Valley, and I've looked there quite hard. I've not seen any. So it might be that it's just not reached this far yet, but a real success story in terms of um, colonization, colonization and um, one to look out for and you might even be lucky enough to see one in the coming uh, few weeks so they are just about hanging on. Um, but if you don't find one in the coming weeks, this is my winter challenge to everyone. So I want Dragonfly recording to continue over the winter for the first time. So these are some shots that I took at, at Melton Country Park last winter. It was a known site for it. So um, I was only proving the existing really, but I mentioned how the female oviposits into a willow stem. So imagine this stem's about the width of your fit the diameter of your finger. And this is where the female has inserted her ovipositor. And each time she pushes it in, she'll lay, she'll actually lay six eggs in there because it's quite an effort to break through the bark. And these will be in diapause until the winter and then they will, will emerge. But you can see how 
these scars, as, as the tree develops, it, it actually causes these scars, which have been known as galls in the past, but the, uh, the experts tell me that, that, that the best terminology is, is just a scar. But please be conscious of these. And if you're wandering the water's edges at the winter, take your binoculars with you and, and see what you can spot. And we might even be able to add some more dots over the winter months, I'm hoping. And this is the final section. So this is my crystal ball section. So. These are my predictions of what may be the next few species to occur in the count. As you can see, things have changed a lot in the last few years, so there's no reason why to think why they shouldn't change a little bit more. This is my um, top bet for the next species to occur in BC 55. So the southern migrant hawker, I've said new to, to the UK, it was recorded back in 1952 and occasionally since then, but there was a massive influx in 2010 and that's when it really started to colonise. And you can see from the distribution dots around the UK, predominantly in eastern species still, but this site, the site just to the south and east of Leicestershire in North Hans, that's about 30 kilometres from the county boundary. And it's been seen to, well, a year, missed a year, and it was there again this year. So it's very, very close. It's seen, been seen to the north north of us. Um, I actually took a, took a day out down to um, Canby Island, the, 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 the prime site for this, this species down in Essex, and I can say it is it's arguably the, the most attractive dragonfly species you'll see in the UK. It really is fantastic. This is a typical breeding site for it. This is what's known um, as the Canby Way Ditch. It's quite a famous dragonfly site, but to me, this site's in the Trent Valley that look very similar to that, and it's um, very tolerant of sites that dry out in the summer, and I can picture some parts of the Trent Valley which, which are very similar. So I think this is very much on the way, want to look out for. I'm so confident, here's a couple of slides showing how it uh, can be identified and uh, split from migrant hawk. So migrant hawker at the top, so viewed from the side, migrant hawk has got these very obvious yellow stripes through the thorax, and the southern migrant hawker has got this beautiful sort of a, a turquoise fading through to yellow, wonderful bright blue eyes, and then a um, very blue fronds facial shield. The other thing I mentioned the um, oh, there we go. I mentioned this uh, golf tea effect. Well, that's there on migrant hawker. It's lacking on southern migrant hawker, and even in flight, you can see what an obviously different insect they are. So, I firmly think the next few years want the one to look out for. Next one on the list, hopefully. The green eyed hawker. Now, this used to be called the Norfolk hawker. Um, clearly, it's expanded well beyond Norfolk and it's right into Cambridgeshire. And that is probably about 50 kilometres from uh, the county boundary now. And they're very healthy populations in Cambridgeshire. So, I had another great day out around St. Neart studying this species. This is the preferred habitat, very well vegetated, often linear water bodies. Um, and this, in comparison, is the Grantham Canal. Now, the Grantham Canal was perfect for it for me, and it's even got introduced water soldier, which is the, the preferred habitat for this species in which to breed. Um, things to look out for, very obvious green eyes, overall brown body, and it's not got the brown wings of a brown hawk, and it's got this wonderful little yellow isosceles triangle. Um, it's got a triangle, so hence the, uh, the second part of its scientific name. So that's my next bet as the next species into the county. That's expanding very well at the moment. This is a real outsider, so um, don't put a lot of money on this one, but people say it may be the next species to take over in the country. It's, though it's predominantly so I took these photos in the North Kent grazing marshes over the summer but it's it's got a site I think that's Berkshire where there's a new site for it now so it is starting to expand and it may come our way and it's a very attractive species it, it's for me it's the the willow emerald of the reed beds but it's got some subtle differences it's got this um, very obvious anti-humal stripe lack of a spur on the side of the thorax and the big is bicolored pterostigma so it's it's the only emerald species with bicolored pterostigma it's another another um ditch in a drainage ditch in a grazing marsh or the habitat but again could be in the trent valley who knows that's got us through pretty much to the end. I just want to leave you with a few useful resources. So British Dragonfly Society, anyone with interest in dragonfly really ought to be a member of the BDS. 
major spot our wonderful county resource has got a great dragonfly page on there and anyone who is in social media has got a facebook account do a search and find the that's your husband dragonfly group on facebook and finally my concluding, concluding message is just as i wrap up then um Please dig a pond if you possibly can. It's, it's hours of, of interest in your garden. It, it's great interest for yourself and it's doing wonders for our impoverished wildlife. Um, it really does need a boost and anything we can do to, to help it on its way will be of great benefit. Record your sighting. So I hope that I've demonstrated that, that they are of great value, not just to me nationally. And there's loads of different ways of sending your sightings in. So please, please, do that for me if at all possible and but over and all above all enjoy dragonflies hopefully i've given you a bit of an insight into what's out there how you can identify them um and hopefully um, perhaps brought a little bit of my excitement to you in terms of uh, the dragonfly population of the county so i will stop the screen share now um and open to any questions i'm happy to return to any of the slides that you might want to see further down the line Thank you uh, very much for that, um, Ian. That was great. Um, I, I think uh, we will have, as, I, as I've told people already, there will be a video recording of this. I think people may have to pour over the video recording to get all of your mm -hmm. identification tips, uh, but we will make that link available. What I'd like to do, um, and we mentioned this, didn't we, on an email, and I, I don't know how we'll facilitate it yet. It might be that I can put it on the Dragonfly group page. Just create a PDF of the of this whole slideshow so that you can work through in, in your own time. Because I was aware there was a lot of material whizzed through very rapidly, um, but happy to return to any of the individual slides, and hopefully we'll get a copy somewhere that's uh, available for everyone to see. That's great. Thanks. Um, so um, Ian's offered to answer uh, any questions. So you can either use the in the chat window if you put your hand up, uh, or you can uh, type a question um, in the uh, chat window, uh, or if you want to unmute yourself, uh, just ask away. While people are um, thinking of a question, I, I've got one. Well, Richard, Richard's got one, but I'll just squeeze in first with mine and then, then we'll come to you, Richard, if that's okay. Um, you didn't say anything about um, larvae, um, Ian, um, in terms of identification and recording larvae. It, it, it occurred to me that in terms of winter recording, that was another possibility. Um, so in, in the interest of not being on for two hours, I did actually have a slide, <laughs> a slide, a slide with a couple of larvae on, and I was going to start talking about larvae, and it, I did a little bit of a, a trimming down exercise quite late on, and that was one of the ones that fell by the wayside, but what I would say is, yeah, if you, if you find any, I think the easiest thing is if you find a, the exuvia, the larval shell of, of dragonflies that have emerged and save those, because I have found when I'm trying to identify a live larvae when they're wriggling around quite a lot, and you're trying to look for certain patterns of hairs on a, uh, yeah, they're, they're keying them out. Certainly the damselfly species can be quite problematic, and I think it's much easier with the larval case, the exuvia. Um, and you can certainly continue through the winter months. I've not done a lot of pond netting, and I think they tend to bury themselves down pretty deeply, don't they? I think you need to uh, forage around, you know, in the deep substrate in the bottom of the pond. But it's certainly something that can continue right through the season. And I've offered before to, yeah, if people have got exuvia, to send them in the post and I'll identify them. I have to admit, I've, I've not spent a lot of time of it lately, and you get a little bit out of practice. I've got in the cupboard over there a, a collection of exuvia of, of most of the species. Species. I used to be able to pick them up and say, oh, yes, this is definitely that. I can narrow it down a bit now and I'm a little bit rusty, but definitely. And, and that is the really the definitive evidence that something has bred at a water body, aren't they? Because these insects are so dispersive, then just by recording one somewhere, it's not as much value as actually recording that larvae or the exuvia. So, yeah, important part of recording for sure. OK, thanks very much. Richard, you had a question. Yes, um, Ian, um, if I send in photos to NatureSpot, for example, and then I include it on my spreadsheet that I'm going to send to you at the end of the year, does this mess things up and create a duplication of records? All I would say 
it's brilliant and I'll accept I'd rather have two records than none at all but I try to keep people's work to a minimum and yeah, as long as it goes into one sort of conduit of information in theory it should all be shared universally now my little little map of how data is shared is not foolproof and I have a few problems I've got things to iron out with the recording center and particularly around nature spot records and verification but in theory I should get your spreadsheet and another copy from nature spot as well but I would I'd say don't go to the trouble of inputting it twice it's not a lot of time and effort isn't it all I do is fill a spreadsheet in and then I fire everything off and I know it shares universally um I just think you do you do brilliant but you're doing twice the amount of work as you need to and I, I I'd say send it to me and I'm I don't yeah uh, we might have somebody from Nature Spot on and I might get told off there I don't mind <laughs> but by all means send it in twice and it won't matter it, it shouldn't confuse things because yeah, I, yeah it's just that I tend to send my photos occasionally to Nature oh okay Spot. yeah I've uh, got to not, not as a record per se but that will generate sending the photo will generate a record well, yeah. not proposing to send you photos unless you want them. I, I would probably the only time I'd, I'd say, oh, I've seen a, I've seen a moorland common hawker. I'd say, are you sure? Have you got a photo? Right. Because it, they're very few and far between, and there's a lot of confusion species. Yeah, yeah. With all due respect to your identifications, girls, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, that's great then that works well doesn't it because you're not actually doing a lot of extra work if you're just submitting photos i just you know in order to get more and more people into this um recording ethos if you say well i need send records in twice it puts people off doing i just want the absolute minimum effort and with the different means of submitting records if, if it's, i find spreadsheets are much easier because i'll got a duplicate size I can filter on and find but for other people if they're just recording periodically they might want to go on to nature spot and find that that um google earth image and then add all the records that way in theory everything should all circulate and be shared universally but I would very much welcome a spreadsheet at the end of the year thank you no problem okay thanks um any any more questions anybody else want to uh yeah, I'd like to ask Excellent. a question. Um, Ian, we we live in Loughborough, and a couple of weeks ago we went to um, the Black Brook, which runs down to Dishley Pool and down to the River Soar. Do you know that area? Because it's there's a stream, a pond, a large pond, and the, the river, and they've nearly all got willows hanging over them. So we we thought it would be the sort of place where we would find the willow emerald if they were there but we we spent I think a Sunday afternoon there and we couldn't find any so I just wondered uh, if you'd explored there. So so a number of points there then but re really interesting Hazel so what I find is you get a sunny day because I work I've had quite a few days I've just dragged while recording but you get a, a, the sunny day at the right time of year and you need to be in 20 places at once so I've actually got a list of places <laughs> where I want to visit Dishley is one of them and I've run out of time this year so I remember one year I, one day earlier in the year right at the start of the, the Willow Emerald season I started off at Melton Country Park where I knew I'd find them and worked my way back west and failed and failed and failed and Dishley was on my list but I ended up going to Charmer Water which is a pretty grim site and I found a single one there <laughs> and I thought I'd have thought there's every chance Dishley it should be there and I think you might still have a chance to find one but just on the Willow Emerald and I know a few of the faces on here of people who've been, been looking for them and they can be a smile to see I'd say they're probably the difficult most difficult species to see in Leicestershire because because they will sit motionless for minutes and minutes and minutes on end in those willows, and you won't see them. Most other yeah. species are, are fairly obvious, and they will move around a little bit. What usually happens is, and it's perhaps because we're, we're it's only just expanding. Into, we're, we've got very low populations now, and they will sit, sit very still if there's only one of them there. What you find is they do 
defend the territories quite rigorously if there's a few of them there. So if you've got a couple of males and one moves, another one will be straight out there and they'll be they'll be defending the territory. But if you've only got one, and I've, I've done loads of recording this year and found a single and a single and a single. I know Carl is on and Dave, Dave is on. They've sent me single records in from size and we've got really low populations at the moment. They're, they're real, they are real swines to find. I think they're the most challenging species <laughs> in the county at the moment, probably because there's so few of them and they sit very still. But that that the great opportunity potentially is finding those ovipositing scars in the mm -hmm. winter and I've not I've only done it at, at Melton and because there's so few of them I don't know how much of a challenge it's going to be in the winter I could imagine spending hours and hours walking around you're not even in shorts are you in the winter it's a bit, <laughs> a bit bleak you're not enjoying it so much as you do in the summer but I'm hoping I can find some more and add some more dots via that process but I, I think we're right on the edge of the range now and I'd have thought they probably are additionally looking at the distribution they ought to be Mm -hmm. very much um, but it's a matter of finding it's a bit of a needle in the haystack in the moment <laughs> I think in the, in the next couple of years it will be the com commonest of potentially species in the county I think it will be anywhere where there's a bit of half decent habitat I was in Suffolk um, we went away for the week before last it was beautiful weather and I was finding them anywhere that looked remotely um, hospitable and even away from the water and they clearly they've, they've bred in large numbers I was finding them on hedges uh, hawthorn hedges mm -hmm. well away from the water and these things are taking off massively um it was oh it was Jeff Jeff what, wasn't it where, where is he oh hello Jeff sorry you, you keep me you were you were up those now you said that it was there was loads of them it was a real common species around the the margins of Rutland around um, Linden mm -hmm. earlier today so it's it's really going to take off, I think, and you'll you'll definitely find them. It's um, I've had a real push this year because I want to update the atlas over the winter. I, I don't intend to do that every year, so I really wanted as many dots as I could to just illustrate that it was starting to become quite common. Um, but I'm sure if you don't find one this year, Hazel, you'll you'll find one next year. But keep trying, don't you? Yeah, want... I think we will. We go well, again. There's more than <laughs> It's forecast to warm up, I think, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if the sun comes out, yeah. I hoping that there'll be another chance to uh, mm -hmm. see something. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, what we 